So we have a um, tradition in our lineage um, to uh, authorize uh, assistant teachers. Okay. And so there's a there's the transmission step, which is full independent teaching authorization. And then um, before that is a is an authorization to be what we call Dharma holders, Dharma holder role. So it's someone who's done um, the majority of their formal study and um, is authorized by their teacher to uh, meet one on one with people and to really hold, uh, you know, hold the space of the of the teaching of the Dharma in a in a more authorized way. So I'm I'm very happy to announce to our Sangha that I'm I'm installing Shoen as a Dharma holder in the Eon Zen Center. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say a little bit about about Shoen's practice. Um, because he doesn't let things go to his head. He's, he's very humble. And he has a, a real maturity of practice that's come from decades, you know, going back to uh, the early, early years of his life and working with very strong teachers, including Maizumi Roshi and, Chir and Shishin Roshi, you know, even his practice predating mine by at least 10 years, I think. He's had quite a, quite a circuitous route, which is really, um, informed in you know informs his um his teaching and his sharing of the dharma you know i think in in some ways he hasn't followed a traditional training path in in the sense of you know he really has always wanted to be a good strong zen student according to the form of a good strong zen student so he's he's taken breaks and he hasn't always pleased his teachers <laughs> and he's gone off on in other directions, um, which has proved, I think, extremely enriching and also humbling uh, to him in his path. So he has a lot to share, a lot to, to a lot of ways to help you, um, all of you, in all of the different uh, parts of your life. You know, wide diversity of people, and you know, you, you know him. Uh, most most of you know him. Uh, for the years of uh, service that he's given already, and, and you understand his expression and his dharma. So I, I won't say too much more, but um, other than um, I would encourage you to go and see him one-on-one. -on -one. I believe he's going to give a uh, daisan, we'll call it a daisan, which is a form of interview, which, is, which, which isn't quite the dokasan level of interview. <clears throat> uh, on Wednesday mornings, I think, are we resolved on that? Yeah, on Wednesday mornings. And I encourage, I encourage everyone to go and see him, um, not only to, um, for yourself, you know, to, to benefit from a personal uh, conversation with him, but also to help him uh, start to work in that form, okay, which I'll want him to do, you know, as, as he heads towards a more, even more formal teaching role. Right. So I, I really appreciate uh, Schoen's decades of practice and uh, appreciative uh, that he'll be able to, you know, help even more uh, for the Sangha. So that's a good um, segue to uh, to the next part. We'll have our reminiscences and sharings about my Zumi Roshi, and I'm going to have Schoen go first. Uh, he does predate my experience with my Zumi by... Uh, I think I think ten years are close to it. So go ahead, Sean. You can take it away. Thank you. And I, I made notes that I'm I'm not going to look at. Uh, and I'll have this be a, as little about myself as possible. But I I first met Mizumi Roshi in 1975. I went um, I, I I went for a, a, an all day uh, introduction to Zen practice at Zen Center of Los Angeles uh, in the spring of 1975. And at the time. Uh, Zen Center in LA was a very thriving, robust place. It was a big organization with a lot going on um, uh, physically. And uh, I always had the sense that Zen Center occupied this whole city block in Koreatown. I don't think it actually did, but it seemed like it. But uh, Zen Center owned a whole bunch of buildings and people, quite a, quite a number of people lived there. Um, there were people who were monks uh, but also householders, people who had families and jobs, were there in the morning for, for sitting, were there in the evening for sitting, but went off to jobs in, in the daytime. And um, 
there was a regular offering of Introduction to Zen Practice, which uh, actually turned into a great book by John Puxpazen. But uh, the thing I wanted to share about this that has to do with Mizuno Hiroshi was, um, you know, I was a kid and uh, somewhat intimidated by this place that I was. And there's a Zen master here. And there were 20 of us or so, and we spent the whole day, and they served lunch, and it was a wonderful introduction. But at some point, with you know all of this activity going on in Zen Center, businesses, uh, Corona Institute, I think, was running at the time, um, you know, all kinds of practice opportunities going on. Maizumi Roshi came in and introduced himself to this group of, of, uh, of, of new people who really were just what behind the ears and uh, I um, it'll it'll be <clears throat> it'll be hard to get across what I want to get across but what that was was and I can't speak for anybody else that was there but I had the sense that he personally welcomed me which of course he probably didn't formally do in that sense you know hi Jeff I'm my Zuni Russian but I had that real intimate sense, and I can't explain why that why that happened. But it was um, you can hear it still affects me. It was tangible. Um, I went away and did other things, as as Sinta he talked about, and and came back in 1983, and I lived there for two three years, and um, and I won't go into the details of this history. It's you know. A, it's well documented, and we don't need to, to you know, to, uh, to, to, you know, to chronicle some of the up, upheaval and so forth that went on at Zen Center LA. Not unlike many other practice centers, including this one, uh, in those years. Um, but it really rocked the community. Um, you know, there were hundreds of people involved, and I think uh, a number of people uh, moved away uh, and, and moved away from the practice or went to other practice centers. And um, Maizumi Roshi was right in the middle of this. And it took a lot of work and a lot of healing and counseling and patience for, for, for that upset of that community to really resolve itself. That's not what I wanted to mention. What I wanted to mention was I got there right after that happened. And um, and again, it, you know, it's something really personal that I, I I don't know that I can convey, but but I I went to see him one on one. I went and sat. I you know I sat every day in the zendo. He gave dharma talks. Um, there were times during the day when you might have mistaken him for the gardener because he's in khaki slacks and a white t-shirt gardening outdoors um, and he was he was the the abbot he's the zen master he's the head of this big 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 practice community and he'd just gone through what really would have rocked anybody else and I'm sure it rocked him but he showed up every day and was just genuine. We talked about the last couple of weeks, we've talked about authentic. It's probably why I like that word so much. Um, perhaps I, I'm remembering him. He was authentic, he was genuine. He showed up and he taught us Zen practice. And, um, you know, I talked to him a number of times. He never brought up what happened. It you know, wasn't my business, of course. But it wasn't important. What was important was him teaching me to do this practice. And um, the thing that's just that was just wonderfully indescribable about it was um, my feeling, and I, maybe I was projecting. I don't know. Again, that was a long time ago of just being completely accepted for exactly how I was. And I had all kinds of stories that I was writing about not being accepted and 
you know, this is mysterious and I'm not, I'm not good enough and I can't get this, and, you know. Um, and it was somewhat compounded by his accent was very strong. So I understood probably, you know, three quarters of what he said. And so there was a little bit of guesswork, but, uh, but I had all kinds of stories about my inadequacy. Uh, but when I went and saw him, that was, that was just gone. That was gone. I just felt completely sufficient. Uh, and adequate. Um, so my, you know, because of that, because of him, yeah, my time there was wonderful, and uh, uh, and it, it, it's influenced me ever since. So, on this twenty eighth year uh, marking of his passing, I just want to say thank you to Roshi for for his kindness, his unbelievable kindness. Um, since he will, I don't want to double up, since I, and I did not compare notes, but uh, hopefully he will mention this in more detail, but um, his influence was extraordinary. He had 12 successors that has now blossomed into a worldwide organization of, well, last time I looked, over 170, it's probably more than that, teachers around the world. So uh, it's just extraordinary um, what one person with integrity and with authenticity and genuineness and real caring can do. So um, what I really wanted to do was to just let his, let his voice speak. And uh, Zen Center LA back in the 70s put out these uh, journals called On Zen Practice. And this is partway uh, th through one called Why Practice? It is as though we had an uncut diamond. We could not really say that it was worthless or say it was something other than a diamond, but unless skillfully cut and meticulously polished, its diamond nature might not be visible. The beautiful color and clarity which make it so highly prized would remain in the realm of potential. Of course, we might sincerely believe it to be a diamond. We might even tell others, this is a diamond and it's worth a lot. Yet it would seem peculiar to say, I don't need to cut and polish this diamond. I know that it is a diamond and that it's good enough for me. Rather, we must cut that diamond and polish its many facets carefully in order that its lovely nature might be shared and enjoyed by all who see it. So it is with our practice. We don't wish to make diamonds out of mud. We wish to properly appreciate what is already inherent. And then at the end of this piece, just a, another short few lines. This kind of practice, this group practice that we're frankly doing here tonight, such as at a Zen Center, can be of real benefit to a world such as ours. Perhaps it is not so irrelevant to a world in which harmony is scarcer even than diamonds, and in which the realization of truth is widely regarded as an impossible dream. In fact, we can say that the three treasures of Buddhism, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, are altogether nothing more or less than practice. The Buddha is the one who realizes. The Dharma is what is realized. And the Sangha is the harmony of practice, both communal and individual, in accord with the Buddha way. In this way, all relationships teach us, even as we appreciate and polish each other endlessly. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I'd like to start my reminiscences with my uh, first encounter with my Zumi Rishi. Um, <clears throat> it was uh, 1990 when I moved to Los Angeles and I had a little exposure to Zen and I was pretty sure that that's the path I wanted to pursue. I had flirted with some other practices. I had done an introduction to the Tibetan Buddhism at the Shambhala Center actually in the building that you all are in right now um, earlier that year, um, but had done some Zen stuff and I felt like a very strong draw to it. So shortly after I got to Los Angeles, um, 
looked up where the Zen centers were, and this is pre-web, so they had a thing called the Yellow Pages. So I went pulled out the Yellow Pages, and believe it or not, they had a section on religion. So I went to religion, and then I went to Buddhism, and then I went to Zen. And this was all nicely organized. And then the first listing was Zen Center of Los Angeles. So I thought, okay, well, that's what I'm looking for. So uh, I didn't call them up, even though the phone number was there. I just looked up their address and apparently just uh, decided to drive down. So I did. I think it was the next day. And um, I forget what day of the week it was. It was in the morning. And I came up to the compound, not knowing where to park or where to go. There's several buildings there. So I just walked up to, there was a building with a carved wood sign of some sort in front of it. And I thought, well, this must be it. So I went up and I knocked on the door and the door immediately opened as if there were somebody right behind it. And sure enough, there was because coming out was an attendant and right behind him was Maizumi Roshi. And Maizumi Roshi just looked me in the eyes, nodded, smiled, and just walked by me. I had no idea what was going on. But then another attendant came right behind him and said, oh, hi, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm looking to, to learn about Zen. <laughs> they said, oh, well, you've come right in the middle of a, of a session. So we're, we're closed you know, to the outside until next week. So come back uh, next week to our public session. And he gave me the details. So what I, what I learned later was that I had walked up to Maizumi Roshi's personal door. Nobody ever went in and out of this door other than Maizumi Roshi. It was his back door into the do his Dokusan room, and he had just come out of Dokusan <laughs> just when I knocked and, and uh, greeted me. So, um, I mean, I didn't realize how kind of mystical it was at the time, but I subsequently learned, you know, what that door was all about and how rarely it's used. And I kind of, you know, retroactively kind of had some tingles in my spine about how, you know, I don't know, karmically appropriate, you know, just magical, you know, the whole thing was. So um, I also did an, an introduction with, with the group uh, not long after that. And uh, it was led by Egyoku, who's now Egyoku Roshi, uh, the abbot of ZCLA. And um, so she spent most of the time with us, but there was just, uh, my Vumi Roshi did drop in. And I was just incredibly in, magnetized by his spirit you know, he was just completely present with this group of 20, 25 beginners from all walks of life, all ethnicities, all ages. And he was just very present and he was really interested in people. Um, everybody went around and introduced themselves and he had a few words with people. And one person said they were raised a Christian and talked about having a Christian background. And he, he right there said, you know, oh, yeah, the Bible has a lot of wisdom in it. You know, Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. But in, in, um, in Zen, we ask, so what is he doing right now? What is that God doing within the kingdom within you right now? And this is a profound teaching, right? It's a profound uh, koan. And, and he, was, he was just really connecting with someone who spoke you know, the language and the faith of, uh, of Christianity. And just met him right there. I mean, I, I remember it to this day, just the scene. I can feel it, um, the power of that question, that, that teaching. And he was like that, just effortlessly, um, you know, bringing out the, the essence of what was happening in the moment. And he was kind of, you know, really inquisitive into the person who's in front of him, no, no matter who it was, you know, as, certainly in Dokusan, but even just out on the grounds. There was a quality that, that I wanted to share that actually Shoen touched on quite a bit and we hadn't prepared in advance. I didn't know what Shoen was gonna share, but in retrospect, um, I was there from 90 to 92. I was a resident there for two years from 90, 1990 to 92. And so this was about five or six years after the, the you know, institutional breakdown that happened with the, um, a lot of the 
the the alcohol abuse and there were you know a variety of things that that came up with his teachings and and the the community you know kind of fell apart you could say in, in a lot of ways a lot of people left at least half the people left the community maybe more and this so this was about five to six years after that and in retrospect i realized that there was something of a malaise you know in the group there um there were there were you know councils that were held led by some of the seniors about how to revitalize the organization um certain kind of you know a sense of maybe something had been lost and needed to be reclaimed but i didn't get one bit of that from my my Zumi roshi ever there was never a sense of something's broken and it needs to be fixed something's lost and needs to be restored um he was definitely remorseful about the mistakes he had made and he he was quite publicly um confessional you know about the mistakes he had made but he wasn't guilty he didn't carry this guilt around that he needed to somehow expunge or um you know i i guess that's the that that's just the way the way it came to me like any sort of heaviness like things needed to be anything other than the way they were um i just got got a sense of of just perfection of this is what's here and we 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 will continue practicing <laughs> you know he's going to practice with whoever shows up for him and we'll we'll work with them and i was one of those people within you know, within less than a year, I was, um, I remember this very distinctly in Dokusan with him. I saw him in Dokusan about once a month, you know, not super frequently. And he was often, you know, off to Japan for stretches of time and, you know, leading retreats in the mountain center and leading retreats in Mexico. So he was in high demand, you know, worldwide in those days, but he would do extended stays in Los Angeles. And uh, so during those times I saw him and uh, there was there was one point it was coming up, and it was I'm, I'm thinking it was maybe a couple of months before my jukai, which I took about a year after moving in to this to the center. And um, I was going through a really rough time. I was really depressed. I was really off center. Um, I was really lost in my life, and I uh, I broke down in tears in Dokusan with him, um, which was very hard for me to do because I saw him as a very imposing you know, the, the old wise Japanese master on the high seat, you know, Zen master. But um, I felt comfortable at that time, you know, break, breaking down for him. And, and he was right there for me very sweetly with, a, with an open heart. He was very warm. And not only was he warm, but he said, you're an important part of the Sangha. We need you. We need you. I'd only been, I'd been there for less than a year. <laughs> there were 50 residents <laughs> in this place. There were hundreds of people, you know, coming through and doing retreats. And, and here I was, and he told me I was an important part of the Sangha. And um, it still moves me. Um, yeah. His, um, he can move through moods and um expressions like um i mean i guess it's it's just it's a cliche but but it it really felt this way it's like there was nothing there <laughs> there was nothing stuck there you know he could be really stern you know particularly if he were setting up a ceremony um which which happened quite a bit and he really wanted to make sure that things were going to go exactly right. So he had people, you know, who are now Roshi's Tenshin and Egyoku and Seisen, who were all, um, you know, seniors at that point. And the, he, ju he just had them on a, <laughs> they were on their toes. They were taking in every single thing he said, you know, to make sure that they were getting it right. They were on task. And he was, he was making sure to communicate extremely precisely. And sometimes you'd get mad. You could see this this fire in him that he wanted things to go well. But five minutes later, he could be smiling and joking. Yeah. 
it, it's just a wonderful kind of um, teaching, just the spirit, you know, the spirit of his energy, his energy, what he conveyed, you know, continuously, you know, a lightness of all the personal stuff and a depth of all the, 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 the deep stuff, <laughs> who he really was. And, and that just really came through. And they weren't separate. He had his own quirks and personalities. You know, he, he'd like laugh at some jokes and then he wouldn't laugh at other jokes. And uh, I remember him, there was a White Plum Asanga meeting. So that's the transmitted uh, successors that he had, which was the Asanga at that point. So it was, it was his 12, actually it wasn't 12 at that point. I think it was 10 at that point. Um, so the Asanga meeting, which now is held, you know, all around the world was always held at ZCLA in those days. And, um, so that his 10 successors had come in, Shishin Roshi was there and, um, Daido was there and I mean, all, all of the 10 successors were there. And what, what, what I remember, I remember a number of things, um, Peter Matheson, per, Peter Murillo Matheson was also present there. He's a successor of Bernie's, Bernie was there. And, and one thing that really stood out to me is um, th th there was this moment where, where um, Maizumi Roshi referenced uh, this book that Daido Roshi had put together. And it was a Dharma book. And it had, a, I think, a lot of photography that Daido Roshi had done. And Daido was a you know, real artistic photographer. I think Gakya is holding it up. I think this might be the book that I'm referring to, that he was referring to. And uh, Mizumi had done some of the commentary, text commentary for it. And, uh, and Mizumi just like give, gave him a dig about it. He's just like, yeah, you put together that art book. <laughs> and he just like was like, ah, that was your project, you know. And, and Dido blushed. <laughs> and if you, if you know Dido, I mean, he had a very severe kind of demeanor to him. He was very, kind of very strict and, and uh, imposing, intimidating, really. And here he was, and he was sitting next to Maizumi, and it, it looked like he was a little kid next to Maizumi, who was probably, what, four or five, six inches shorter than him. And he's, and he's just, so oh, you put that art book together. He's like, oh, oh. <laughs> it was really tender. You know, he wasn't mocking him by any means, but he was, there was a little bit of like a puncturing of any sort of, you know, ego around some special, any, any special teaching, any specialness, you know, specialness around uh, being, being a successor of his. I like that. I like that. It really helped, you know, help me. I guess the last thing I'll say is I, I, I learned so much also just the formal Dharma, you know, Maizumi was quite a scholar. He, he did extensive study into Dogen and other um, Zen teachers, you know, from the past, just extensive study translations and, uh, commentaries that he had and you can you know most of them are, are out there now still um and his dharma talks were incredible they were they were very deep um even as a beginner i could i would have mo a moment or two of of clarity of something maybe clarity isn't the right word but some kind of opening in almost every one of his talks even though it's so esoteric to me you know, um, Japanese words, concepts from Dogen. I'm not really understanding in any traditional sense, but there would be one or two openings that I would have where I would just, something would be transmitted um, in every one of his talks. Yeah. I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful for crossing his path and he, uh, his presence really was enough for me to just maintain with the lineage. Um, you know, I just, I, I just had entered the stream, not only of his Dharma, but his successors. So I just felt, you know, when, when Shishin Roshi was available to come and move to Boulder, um, 
and and those of you who know Mazumi and and Shishin, I think might agree that Shishin is is perhaps the successor most like Mizumi in many ways, in many ways. So that that maybe helped me, but um, it was just a natural um, natural extension for me uh, to to enter that stream, and I'm I'm happy to to still be a part of it, and I can now no longer exit. <laughs> <laughs>